Wendell Foster. How's everybody doing? Good. Wow, you guys have energy. It must be a week today. The other group All right, on your table there is a policy packet and a signature form for the policy and a test. So please make sure everybody has one. If not, I'll go around and pass out the forms. So I know you're excited as I am. This is the first in service of 2020. Are you guys ready for this? Yes. No. You lie. <laughs> All right, so today's service will be on the All Hazards Emergency Plan. We're going to uh, present more information and more ideas on what we can do to be prepared. We have communication, has to do with chemicals and the SBS data sheet. But first, we have Molly who's going to show us some new policies and some updates to uh, other policies. So please give it up for Molly. Into human resources, 
before the candidate applies. And then this also is effective today. So if you had a friend that started here a few months ago, um, that doesn't make you eligible. So you fill out this form and then you tell them to apply and then things will start to go online after that. Um, but they have to be here for six months as a full-time or a regular part-time employee. There's a certain level of discipline that they're not allowed to go over in that six months. If they get up to a written warning or a final written warning, or if they're terminated in that six months, then your name comes out of that drawing, um, even if you refer them. This also has to be their first contact with the organization. So if they worked here before and they're wanting to come back and you know them, um, that doesn't put your name in the drawing because they worked here before. This is not their first contact. So definitely look through the criteria. There are quite a few criteria, but if you refer somebody and you can make it through the criteria, then your name will be in this um, for the thousand dollars at the end of each quarter. So you can see human resources for these forms and make sure that you get them turned in before the person applies and we will go from there. So if you will sign the policy acknowledgement form and I will be back here at the end of this in service if you guys have any questions about any of these policies. And I'll turn it back over to us. Thank you. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about the All Hazards Emergency Plan. And you notice how we talk about this at every in service, every opportunity. And trust me, it's not because I want to all the time, but it's because our training needs to be constant. This plan changes all the time. And honestly, what's the point of having a plan if we don't know what to do with it? So, first off, let's talk about what the plan is. Now, this is a plan that is. We have to follow thanks to certain law, laws of legal aspects. In fact, it's created because in the past, when Hurricane Katrina happened and other incidents, there were a lot of people in nursing homes that passed away. They didn't have to. And a lot of times they passed away because people in management weren't there at the time of the emergency and staff didn't know what to do or how to make the right decisions. That's why we have such plans in place, because we all know in a perfect world, It'd be nice if management was always here when there's a crisis. But that doesn't happen in real life, does it? And so we want you to know what to do and how to do it if the situation happens. So this is a full spectrum plan, which means that we look at everything that can happen around us and we do our best to try to find ways in which we can uh, make decisions and do the right thing. Now, this plan is more than just what we can do to help people live here. It's also about what we can do to help you. What we can do to help the people that are visitors here, and not only that, but other people in the community. So if an incident happens that affects others, we need to be ready to help them also. An example of this is exercises we do throughout the year. And with the exercise, we're told that some institution has to evacuate and they have residents that need to go elsewhere. Do we have room for them? It's called any open beds. Now, we usually stay at full capacity, so we don't have room for anybody else to come live here. But it is an example of how we can be a resource to others if we did. So in that regards, the plan isn't just about us at Wendell Foster, it's about our community as a whole. And again, our plan is also to help people like you as employees to be prepared and to know that if you're here helping us, we've got your back. We have what you need to make sure that Fan, you have water and you're good to go. <clears throat> now, the plan, we know it's not perfect. We do the best we can to address anything that can happen around us. And we do have a lot of tools at our disposal. We have an online tool that we use right now that gives our precise location and tells us what natural threats that we face. Anything from flooding to, to uh, tornadoes, uh, earthquakes. And we also can look back at things that happened to, to us in the past and say, okay, if it happened once, or if it happened twice, it's probably going to happen again. And so that's what we also use to determine what threats we face. Now with this plan, it states who's in charge and who will make decisions in an emergency. And also tells us specifically what to do. Now, in the past when I do in services, I usually get test back that has questions on there saying, well, if management's not here, what do we do? Well, if we have a written plan that tells you step by step what instructions to take in an emergency, what do you think you should do if management's not here? Follow the plan. Follow the plan. That is it in a nutshell. And that's the whole purpose of having a plan. 
So you don't have to rely on us to tell you what to do. You can open that book up and say, okay, it's an earthquake. Step one, keep people safe. And it takes you through the entire step. Uh, we do have these plants located in a few locations. The first is in Sarah Poole's office. And people always tell me, how do we get access to it? All the nurses have keys to that office. If the situation is bad enough, take this opportunity to kick that door in. You know you've always wanted to do it. Bust on that door, grab the plant. But every nurse does have a key. You can use that, open it up, grab it off of a bookshelf. The other plant is in Kelly Turnham's office. Please don't kick in the door. Just use the key, open it up. And in Eric Sharp's office, the CEO is one on his bookshelf. <coughs> there is another plan that is a little bit different that works just like the, the main plan. That's one for the Green Therapy Pavilion. They have a different set of regs. So a plan has been created for them. It works in conjunction with the one from the ICF. So you can refer to both and you will see that they look a lot alike. Now this is important because the event may affect them over in outpatient services that may not affect us in ICF. So that's why we have two plans there. Their plan is located at the receptionist desk. So no doors to kick in. Now, within this plan, we list a command structure. This is the chain of command. Uh, don't worry too much about reading all the small letters. There's another slide that will play it out for you. But I want you just to see what the structure looks like. Why is it important to have a chain of command during emergencies? Who knows? What's that? No That's right, so there's no panic. If we know who's in charge and who to take direction from, there's less chaos. And if everybody's doing their own thing, we're going to be working against each other. So if we have a chain of command, and that's where we take our instructions from. Now with our chain of command, we have our succession of command. So this means we have redundancy built in this plan. So Eric Sharp is top dog, right? He's our CEO. He's at the top of our chain of command, but if something happens, let's say he's on vacation somewhere or he's incapacitated, the only turn on can step into that role and assume command. Heaven forbid if something happens to Kelly, then it can be Sarah Poole and they become a trainer. So we have a lot of redundancy built into this plan to make sure we have a chain of command structure. Within that structure are all these other various roles. And if you're involved in this, you're being trained on it, you will know what your role is and how to do it in advance. And we're also coming up with action cards that you can just grab it and know what you're supposed to do and how to do it. You may not be aware of it, but behind the front desk in the uh, reception in Elmer Building, there's an actual black box. Inside that box is everything we need to start our emergency operations center. And inside of that are the action cards, along with a lot of other supplies. So, what is your role? An emergency has taken place. It's a holiday. Most members of management are not here. What do you do? Keep the residents safe. Make sure they're safe. Keep the residents safe? What else? How do you know what actions to take? Follow the plan. Follow the plan. Simple as that. Grab the plan, open it up, turn to the right page, follow it step by step. Now I'm going to be honest with you. If something does happen, those of us in management, as soon as we're aware, we're going to come here to Wendell Foster to help keep this place going. There shouldn't be that much of a time gap between the incident happening and help arriving because we do have members of management that live just a few blocks away. So if need be, they can always walk over here. But this is a stopgap measure to help you make decisions you need to during that time frame. Now, during any kind of emergency, who decides what actions to take? Who decides? That's right, person in charge, chain of command. It started with Eric Sharp and filter on down. If they're not here, it's going to be your senior supervisors, senior nurses, those and those leadership positions. Now what could happen if we had this plan but don't use it during an emergency? Anybody know? I would not want to be Sarah Poole if that happens. Because we'll be held to the highest legal standard, the highest accountability to follow this plan. If an emergency happens, state representatives will come here 
to check on this and help out, but also to grab a copy of the plan and to see if we're following it. And if we don't, we are held liable. Now, the highest liability for this would be for Sarah Poole since we work under her license. She could go to jail for that. It's pretty serious, isn't it? So we need to know this plan, we need to practice how to use it, and we need to follow it. So in that regard, there's going to be something good happening this year. I've been tasked with having quality assurance checks every quarter. So every quarter, I'm going to pull staff aside, we're going to gather in a room, and we're going to have a tabletop exercise with this plan. And what I usually do is I come up with some scenario, some natural disaster. I kill eternal has made me promise not to kill people off in this disaster. <laughs> but there is one I'm holding back. <laughs> and what we're going to do is we're going to have the plan right there. I'm going to take you through different scenarios. You're going to tell me how do we react, what do we do. And with this, we identify what do we have missing in the plan that we have not thought of. Or what do we have written down that we're supposed to do that makes no sense. And all this does is gives us information of how to change the plan to make it better. So once a quarter, don't be surprised if you get an email from me requesting a meeting so we can do this. It's painless. It takes about one hour. It's, it's really, some people have fun with it. It's not that bad. It's just an exercise. Now, what are some disasters you think we might uh, find ourselves in here in Middle Foster? Tornadoes. Tornadoes. It is close to that time of year, right? Actually, there was a tornado, uh, a couple of them, it was last weekend. I know one was in uh, Hawkins County. What else? Earthquake. Earthquake. Yep. What else we got? Active shooter. Active shooter. It is almost frozen. Mm -hmm. What else we have? Fire. Fire. There are so many things we can mention. And what we had to do is we had to identify our top four threats. Now, these are our top four hazards, but based on events that could happen, information that comes into us, this could change over time, but this is our top four hazards we've recognized. And this is Kentucky, so we know weather can change at a, any, at a drop of a dime, and so it could be hot weather, it could be a drought, it could be snowstorm, ice storm, tornadoes, whatever it might be. It could even be hurricane winds that we have with hurricane night when it came through. And we all know about water contamination, communication failure, and right now the flu is very active. A lot of people are not already from it. So, these are our top four hazards, and within our plan, these are things that are addressed. Now, to address this stuff, I'm going to be honest, we're not experts. We've had to do a lot of learning with this. And so we've had to work in partnership with Davis County Emergency Management Agency, with GRAD, <coughs> and also Long-Term Care to Prepare, which is a network of professionals across the state that work in nursing homes, hospitals, and with the University of Kentucky. So we've had to do a crash course with all this, and we were still learning from it all the time. And we learned through drills, exercises, and training events, and seminars. So we partnership and train outside of here and on site too. How many of you were here when we evacuated cottage A and B and then C and D? Did we learn a lot with that? I know we learned a valuable lesson about make carts on those vans. <laughs> Strap them down. Don't hold on to them. They will take you across the vehicle. That was cool. It was, a, it was in the yeah, You saw it. It's only by doing this and going through it that we actually strengthen our plan and learn what to do or what not to do. These are what the plans look like. The one on the left is the one that will be for the ICF and the majority of the facility. It's the one that is red. The one on the right is the one you'll find over at the Green Therapy Pavilion. And that one is kept behind reception steps. So how do we prepare? So we do have supplies on hand. We don't have an infinite amount of supplies because it takes up a lot of storage space. But we do have enough to keep us independent and self-sufficient for about three or four days. This includes food, water, medications, and medical needs. We have other forms of communication, transportation, and evacuation shelters if we need to. And we've also listed this plan, the exact location for utility shutoff, along with pictures, pre-coordinates, and instructions on how to ship those things off. Now, please keep in mind that 
any other time, maintenance needs to be the one that ships off utilities. And in most circumstances, they will be here during disasters. But if, it's, if it came down to it, you do have that information at your fingertips. Just look in the plan and follow the step-by-step instructions. If we do ever have to evacuate, I put in this plan all the evacuation points, three different routes and how to get there, multiple copies of the written directions along with multiple copies of the maps. We also have the phone numbers and point of contact for those agencies so we don't just show up and say, we're here. They need to know we're coming, right? They need to know to open the doors for us. So we have all of that instructions on who to call and when to call them. We've also listed our facility floor plans, generators, and all electrical information because if it's bad enough, EMA can come in and take over our facility and they need to know what we have and how to use it. So again, when an event occurs, staff are going to respond to address the issue, keep people healthy. And what do you refer to when responding to this? The plan. The plan, that's right. When management gets here, incident command will be established and we will work on moving from a reactive response to a proactive response. This includes gathering up facts and working with other people outside of here. And then afterwards, we're going to have a lot of meetings with you and with others to determine what needs to change, what needs to stay the same. Any questions on that? Yes? On the question where it says, uh, if we do not follow the plan, what would happen? Why is our focus what state concerns are? Because that kind of seems selfish. It does. It really does. Because it shouldn't be more on the care of the people versus more of a selfish response. If we don't follow the plan, then someone's going to get injured or hurt. That's right. And there's two consequences for not following it, and you're correct. We don't want to be selfish to say it's only because we want to stay legal. But that is a true aspect of it, though, because if we can't help people if our doors close, right? <coughs> but at the same time, following the plan will keep people safe. So you're correct on that. There's two reasons to follow the plan. To keep people safe, because we have looked at the best response we can provide, that is to make sure that we can continue operations. Now what you see up here is something I emailed out just recently, and it's not permanent, it's just a stopgap measure, but I want to make sure that everybody has an idea of what the codes are and how to respond. I'm working on creating something that looks more professional, that would be a quick access card, quick reference card for any emergency that we address. But right now, you'll see these posted in your workstation. If it's not, please go ahead and post it so that when people see code silver, we don't think that it's uh, something different. And remember, code silver is elopement. I've had people say it's when somebody escapes. This is not Shawshank Redemption. People aren't looking to escape, all right? Now, we do need to address policy F 28, which talks about the code trigger. Hopefully, we never have to use this plan, but it's good to have one and not need it, right? So, we've split this up into three separate levels. A level one is a minimal security lockdown. When this occurs, it means there's something that's happening around three blocks away. It could be an officer involved shooting. It could be a manhunt for somebody. But something that poses a slight risk to Wendell Foster. And it's kind of like that meme when they say, you know, there's a chance. And that's what we're basing this off of. If there's a chance for a threat to us, we're going to initiate this. All staff on and off duty, we'll be briefed on the situation. And we're going to lock every single exterior door that we have, and any staff member that's outside will go indoors to their workstation, and we're not going to stop what we do. We're going to keep working. We want everybody to stay inside unless they have to leave for work-related reasons. We will stop off-foot in vehicle traffic in and out of our facility. We don't want people coming, cutting through our, our parking lots or through our park. We want to make sure we stay secure. And then if this is a domestic violence incident, maybe threats were made, or somebody was hurt and is still a threat, we're going to check on that person throughout the day to make sure they're okay. If this was to escalate, it's a situation that's closer to us, maybe a block away, or it could be where the threat's been made and they're heading toward us. 
This could be a threat that's a verbal nature. It could be physical in nature. But if this happens, we're going to escalate this to a partial security lockdown, level two. The incident command center will become activated. All staff will be briefed on the situation, including those off duty, and off site and off duty staff will be told to stay away. So if you're out shopping with somebody, we're going to call you up and say you need to stay away until we give you the all clear. And we'll give you some ideas of what to do, how to do it. Every exterior door is locked, or else we'll shut off the badge readers. And if you need to gain nice access, you need to show your badge to whoever's inside. This is to prevent somebody from just grabbing a badge and gaining access to the buildings. Plus, inside the buildings, we're going to have a roving guard every 15 minutes checking every door and window to make sure it stays secured. So if you're jonesing for that cigarette, you better wait. You don't want to be going in and out and putting people at risk. At the same time, we're going to make sure that all operations stop. We're going to gather to the workstations or wherever workstation that is, the central area, and wait to be briefed. We're going to get ready in case this does escalate to a code black. Now, if this does escalate to a code black, this is a situation where an intruder, somebody with intent to do harm to others, is on site, either on a property or in our buildings. First thing you should do is get people to an area of safety. As soon as they are, you call 911. I didn't know you could text 911, parent, you can. And when you call 911, what's one of the first things you should tell them on the phone? They took them into a Yes, that you're at 815 Triplet Street. Give them your location. That way, if you lose contact with them, they know where you're at. Now, you can ask a passerby to do this. That's fine. If somebody needs to make that phone call, shoot that text message to them. Tell them the exact location of where the threat is. Now, from the window across your phone, you can also pay through using pound 96 and pound 10, and now it's code black. Again, get the location of the threat. I've had people argue this with me before, saying, well, if you page code black and get the location of the threat, you're telling the intruder that you know where they're at. Yeah. Trust me, they know where they're at, too. It'll be okay. You want everybody else to know where they're at, so make sure you page that and let everybody know where the threat is. And if you can, call the front desk at extension 200 and let them know what's going on. That way they can help you alert people. Now, this first bullet point here is pretty harsh for some people, but if there are people that's wounded and you're in a safe area, do not help them. One of the first things we learn in first day is scene safety, right? If there's an active shooter, is your scene safe? No. No. Leave them where they're at. This happens a lot in active shooter situations, even in war. You shoot the wound, you wait for the counter to people to provide aid, right? And then you do harm to them. Don't fall victim to that. If you can, get out of the building. Now, if you're going to run and get out of the building, where do you run to? When do you stop running? As soon as you make that out the door. As soon as you get out the door? If that's where you feel safe. I'll probably stop and hit you to go. I'm going to go as far as I can to get away from that threat, right? <laughs> leave your things behind. If you leave your cell phone here, don't worry about it. They're not here for your phone. It will be fine. So if you are running and have your phone, you can put on speaker, call for help, and let them know what's going on. We call 911. You also want to help the people that live here get to safety or to run away too. So don't forget about them. Try to get them out of the building if at all possible. Now this is where we're going to deviate from what we've taught in the past. So I attended a training last year that was talking about what we teach with run, hide, fight. And they say that uh, it's, we've been doing it wrong. Because when we teach people to hide, you're teaching them to be defenseless and to be victims. Because when people think of hide, they think of hiding under your table, hiding under your desk. And we can look at the past uh, incidents of violence in workplace and schools and see that those were the people that didn't make it. Instead, you want to take control, instead of just hiding and thinking that if I don't see them, they can't see me, you need to go find a place that you can seek shelter and restrict access to and hopefully defend it. So look for places like that, but don't hide. When you hide, you've reduced your risk of surviving this. 
And when you find your area of safety and shelter, you need to harden it up and get ready for a fight. So, part of this is restricting access. How many of you have ever had your foot run over by a wheelchair? Are they heavy? Yeah. yeah. What if you're putting a bunch of wheelchair in front of the door and turn it off? Could that restrict access? Take the person out of the chair. <laughs> Please. Get them as far away from that chair as possible, <laughs> off to the side, but put it in front of the door. They're not going to get out of the door very easy, are they? So, just an idea. Also, turn off anything that makes a noise or anything that emits a light. Turn it off, shut it down. You don't want to attract anybody to your position. Don't stay in front of doors or windows. They throw bullets. Stay away from that. Get as far away from it as possible. And then look in your environment for anything you can use as a weapon. Anything from an ink pen to a pot full of coffee. In fact, you get filled with a bunch of cups of coffee. Somebody comes in shooting, they have a hard time hitting you if you throw it out the face. Now, last year, there was a news story about some schools that were giving teachers buckets of rocks. And I laughed and made fun of it until I went to this training and figured out what it was about. So at this training, they told somebody, I'll give you 20 bucks if you take this Nerf gun that has a laser on it and keep it aimed at this person. If you keep it aimed at them, you get 20 bucks. In the meantime, we're all throwing Nerf balls at their head. They didn't get the money. If you throw stuff at active shooters at their face, they have a hard time hitting their targets. Food for thought there. It's also proven that it's easier to hit your target if they're running away from you versus them running towards you. And if the shooter is changing magazines, what's a good thing to do at that time? Run toward a threat. Because he's defenseless at that point. These are things to keep in mind because with our policy, we state that as a last resort and only if you're cornered and you believe in life's in imminent danger, we recognize you have the right to fight. I'm going to be honest with you. If you do choose to fight, don't fight fair. Anybody that wins a fight will tell you that if you fight fair, you lose. You fight to survive. That means you throw items, you wield items, you use improvised weapons, act aggressively, you yell, you rush. You want to be the most crazy, psychotic person that person's ever seen in their life. You want to make it where they regret and think again about their choice. Now, when law enforcement arrives, we're lucky in this town, it takes about 5 to 10 minutes. The national average is 15 minutes. <coughs> Even 5 minutes is a long time, right? Now, the reason this happens is unlike what we see on social media and news, they don't come in one at a time. That's stupid, because a lot of them are plain clothes. If they come in one at a time with a pistol looking for a threat to see each other, they see each other as a threat. They will wait and they will stage until they have four to six people and then they'll come in as a squad. Now when they come in, they're looking for one thing and to do one thing. What is that? Eliminate the threat. Eliminate the threat. So if you have your phone in your hands, what do you look like? A threat. Don't get shot. Drop your phone. They're not there to save you. They're not there to help you. If you're wounded, if you're scared, don't yell out, they're not there for you at all. They're there to go find that threat. And that's where they're going to go, is the last location of it. If you yell out, you just gave away their element of surprise. So please don't do that. And if they tell you to squat and quack like a duck, flap your arms like a duck, and walk like a duck, I will be the best darn duck you've ever seen. I will follow every command they give me at that moment. Do not leave your area of shelter until they give you the all clear. Once the officer is given, then we can render aid to anybody that needs first aid. Are there any questions on that? I really hope this is a policy that we have and just don't ever need. But if you ever need more training on it, let me know. We will train on this throughout the year. All right, water shortage. Do you remember last year when we had a water shortage? Did anybody make a lot of money like I did some bottles of water on Facebook? No. I wish I did. I'm ready this next time. I'm going to be rich. $5 a bottle. So what we learned last time, one of the first things is don't panic. It'll be okay. 
one of the reasons we build kids because we have really awesome maintenance men here that went above and beyond, worked really crazy hours, got creative, and brought water in from the outside. They have water stations located outside every cottage. They had us ready to go. They even brought in porta potties. And now I know porta potties in August doesn't always smoke, right? But still, that is better than the alternative. One thing we did realize, though, is that there is a direct need to follow all commands from the chain command because what happens is everybody does their own thing. Everybody's grabbing water and using them for different reasons. Drinking water is not made to give people baths. That's not what it's there for. It's not there to flush toilets. It's there for drinking, preparing food, maybe washing hands. That's it. So because of that, we realized there was a problem last time. We're going to make some changes. So next time, we're going to have one person keep an active count of how much water we have, and they'll be the person to distribute it to whoever needs it. That way, there's some semblance of control. Last time, our supply of water was depleted by over half within half a day because too many people were grabbing it for other reasons. So this time, we're going to change it a little bit. Also, be mindful that we don't just get on Facebook and ask people for water because we're in need. Because the result is a mountain of water bottles that will stay in that back corner for eight months. See if I remember that mountain of water bottles? Oh my gosh. It was huge. So, if we have a need for you to solicit water from people, we will tell you. We'll send out a directive. Until then, please don't get on Facebook and say we need water because the community wants to help us. And we'll get so much water brought in that we can't even use it. So let's save that resource until we really need it. And again, I know portable toilets aren't that great, but at least it's something. So please use those when we get them and don't flush toilets with drinking water. All right, code red. What does that mean? Fire. That means fire. If you're in cottages, if you're in a cottage and there's a fire in your cottage, what do you do? Get out. Where do you go? To the young building. Now, if you are evacuating people out of the building, and let's say you have somebody in a wheelchair and somebody else is in bed, who do you evacuate first? The wheelchair. You want to maximize how many people you can evacuate in the shortest amount of time. So, depending on mobility, each mobility goes first. If you're in a different cottage or a different department and there's a cottage that has a fire going on or a fire drill, where do you go for help? Come here to the young building. And you're going to be here to help keep a count of who comes in, keep a head count, help take care of people. And if there's a need in that cottage, they will come over here, point at you and say, come here, I need your help. So this is where you'll go to await orders. Now, if you're at William and Hall, Green Therapy Pavilion, Laundry, Dietary, the Kitchen, no more building, you will evacuate outside during the time of fire drill or fire. Not too many people uh, know, but for us a new employee, this place is big. It's a lot of hidey hose. People get lost a lot. So if this is you and it happens and you need to get out quick and in a hurry, please grab the evacuation planes off the walls and refer to it. That's what it's there for. Don't be shy about it. Also, if you didn't know, we have our systems monitored by a company called Simplex. How many of you do fire drills here as supervisors? Show of hands. All right, so what's one of the first things you should do before you do a fire drill? Call Simplex. Call Simplex. Please tell them to put us offline because if you don't, who's going to pay us a visit? Fire department. Let me tell you from personal experience, that is embarrassing. Please don't do that. Put the system offline because if we don't, they're going to think we have a real fire and we're going to send fire trucks here. And then when we're done, call them again and tell them to put it back online. Now, if you work in SEL and the fire breaks out, you're going to react just like you would at home. Get people out of there. Push them out with a wheelchair, help them walk out, carry them out. If you have to, sheet drag them. But if you sheet drag somebody, do you drag them head first or feet first? Head first. Head first, please. Don't hurt them. Drag them feet first, your head's going to bounce off everything. So don't do that. Support their body and neck, drag them out. And then call 911. 
Every department does have fire extinguishers. They are ABC type, which is good for pretty much everything. With these fire extinguishers, there are some key things to remember. One is the acronym PASS. Every fire extinguisher has a pin on there, has a little circle middle loop, kind of like what you see with grenades. Don't pull it out with your teeth, that hurts. But you have to pull that pin in order to squeeze that handle. So first thing you do is pull the pin. Then you aim the nozzle at the base of the fire, squeeze that handle and sweep it back and forth. But if the fire is bigger than a trash can, it's not going to work for you. So we're going to have to go ahead and just evacuate and call for help. It's also good to teach people to live here what to do in the fire. I remember when Shelby Ray was here, the only way to get him out of the building was by giving him the fire extinguisher. The dude knew how to use it too, so you have to be careful. But that is great to teach a person that, hey, if there's a fire, go grab the fire extinguisher. Here's how you use it. Or go to that door and get out of here. So keep that in mind. That's a good thing with active treatments, to teach people how to be self-sufficient like that. Now, what about code yellow? What does that mean? Tornado. Tornado. If this happens, and you get on 14news.com, it is not a tornado. All right? <laughs> tornado. Remember that. Represent, right? And there is a difference between a, a, a tornado watch and a tornado warning. Tornado watch means you have all the ingredients, but they haven't been put together. Tornado warning means you're going to have cupcakes. Now with a tornado watch, this is a good time to review all the procedures we have in place, especially with your new staff. They probably don't remember what to do. And check your flashlights and emergency kits. I've been checking these once a week. I really don't know what's happening. I swear they're growing legs, they're moving around, and I put them back in the same spot and they move again. So please check them, make sure you know where they're at, and monitor the weather with your apps, with the weather radio, whatever you have available. Now, the people who live here, we don't want to scare them, but honestly, they're pretty used to this. Your co-workers are used to want to get more panic, so try to keep everybody cool, calm, and collected. If this does turn into a tornado warning, you may hear sirens outside. If the sirens go off, does that mean that it's over? No. No. If you hear two to three sirens, what does that mean? You might know. Each time the siren goes off, it means there's a new threat. And the sirens are on a timer, so it'll only go for like a minute or two based on the programming. So if you hear it multiple times, there's multiple threats out. If this happens, you need to go to a basement preferably. If you don't have that, go to a room that has an interior walls and no external walls. Make sure we page code yellow. Keep a good head count of all staff. These are locations in which you'll seek shelter. So Green Therapy Pavilion, you go to the bathrooms. SEL, go to the internal, interior room without internal walls. Wiedemann and Elmer, you go to the basement. So right know where the basement is. Isn't that the housekeeping area? Yes, right by Jim Brown's office. If you don't know, get with me and I'll show you guys. In the ICF, you go to the bathrooms, but remember, they have half walls. Stay behind the half wall. And don't put anybody in those closets. That's a traumatic for them. Keep those closets closed. And for maintenance, they have a big metal building full of sharp objects and no interior rooms. So we'll be thinking of them. <laughs> now, our plan also addresses personal preparedness. So part of this is to know that we cannot expect you to take care of people here if you don't have what you need at home for your family. So please keep a first aid kit on hand for yourself. <coughs> Go adultery, grab a bag, load it up full of uh, gauze and pads and band-aids, whatever you need. Pay for it, please. Pay for it. But then keep that kit handy so that you have it at home if you need it. Also, go in there, grab some candles, flashlights, batteries, and uh, make yourself a lights out kit. Put coloring books and crayons in it for your kids and keep them occupied. And make copies of all your personal documents. Go get a fireproof safe from Menards or Walmart or cheap. Put it on there so you have all that that you need. And if you don't have a smoke detector or fire extinguisher, please buy one. Check them regularly. Keep them up to date. Keep three days of food on hand, non-perishable. And use this food every few months so you can uh, 
uh, put it back and make sure it's fresh. Make sure you buy food that your kids will eat. Keep bottled water on hand and make sure you have all the medicines for people in your family. That's the worst time to run out of medicines when pharmacies are closed. If they are closed, you can go to rxopen.org and they will give you a list of what pharmacies are open in your area during a disaster. And they'll also tell you what Red Cross shelters are open to. Any questions on that? All right, last topic, I promise. Hazard communication. I used to think that this wasn't a big deal until this past week and I started doing some checks on uh, chemical storage here and I have two things that popped out. One was I went into a, a supply closet with stored chemicals in the cottages and up on a shelf or some shorts, everything's above my eye height, but about this high up is a chemical in a bottle Bottle's full, the lid's off. What's the risk of that? Fall off and get in your eyes. Yeah, it can fall off and get in my eyes. So I dispose of it. I also found a spray bottle that had a label on it that was really interesting. And those that have been here for a long time may remember this. The label said Bathco Mint Disinfectant. Does anybody remember that? Show of hands. Yes. We stopped using it around 2012. Is that an old label? Yeah. So if somebody gets that chemical in their eyes or they ingest it and we need help and we go look at Bathco Mint, could this turn out really ugly? Yeah. So we need to make sure that every secondary container we use has a label on it. If you don't have them, let me know. I'll get them for you. It was really quick to fix this. The labels are in that supply closet. It's just a sticker put on the bottom. Yes? <coughs> <laughs> it smells kind of like the breath bits on a table. <laughs> so we also have safety data sheets to help keep us all safe. Now safety data sheets are departmental specific for what chemicals are used there. And right now we are revamping these to make sure everything is accurate to the point. So you're going to see some new ones at the front desk. But here's the deal. You need to read these. I know they're boring. They're very boring to drive. But you need to know what chemicals you can come in contact with every day. And it's going to have the things all listed up here on that safety data sheet, including pictograms, hazard levels, and signal loads. There are 16 sections to it. Trust me, I'm not going to read all of these. But just know that there are 16 sections. There is a section 4 that does talk about first aid measures. So if this is something that harms somebody, refer to this, it will tell you what steps to take. And it also talks about your PPEs. Keep in mind that with PPEs, it's not just the gloves we use in healthcare. It can be thick rubber gloves when working with chemicals, steel toe boots, it could be safety glasses, it could be any of those. Before you perform a task with these chemicals, you need to look at what PPEs are required and use them. We keep a lot of stuff in storage, so if you run out, let's get some more, bring it down there, let your supervisor know. But make sure you use your PPEs. And it also tells us how to dispose of the chemical. Should we be dumping chemicals down the drains and flushing down the toilets? No, please don't. The hot river is polluted enough, let's not add to it. So we know every chemical, every container has to be labeled. It should have a chemical identity, hazard associated with it, hazard level and pictogram. Do not put flammable chemicals in a secondary container. So that means you do not take gas and pour it into a styrofoam cup. What would happen if you do? It will melt right through it. It's kind of cool to watch though. Now, on the labels and on the SDS sheet, you will see two different signal words. One is warning, that means there's a less severe hazard. The other one is danger, just means there's a higher hazard. So all of this stuff will be on the label and it's going to be on the SDS sheet. These are what the pictograms look like. And most of them are common sense except for the flame over circle. That means that the chemical agents and oxidizers when exposed to oxygen it increases the likelihood it will catch on fire like phosphorus. The only way you put out a fire with phosphorus is to eliminate the oxygen. 
And this one, skull and crossbones, means there's pirates in the area, certain death. So watch out for that. And the environmental one means it's a hazardous to wildlife. These things are really handy to look at because if you're ever in traffic and there's a semi that's had a wreck and has chemicals on it, you're going to look at these placards on the back of the semis and know if you need to get the heck out of there. So keep that in mind. Store the chemicals behind a lock and a key. So behind a locked door or a locked cabinet. Take the keys out of the lock and hang them up, please. This also means that the mop carts that we use should not be stored in the bathrooms behind the curtains. That's not secured. That's called hidden, not secured. Don't store food or drinks with the chemicals. I've found Gatorade bottles stored next to the chemicals. These chemicals can leach into that Gatorade, make it taste really funny. So please don't do that. This talks about all the PPEs we have available. And again, this could be anything from vinyl gloves to covering system gloves. This could also be steel toe boots. <coughs> if you do spill something, please clean it up immediately. Get somebody to help you isolate the area, grab the SPS sheet, and they will tell you how to clean it up. And make sure you use the right PPEs. If a chemical or a substance gets in your eyes, we have added more eyewash stations this past year to our facility. So, man, we actually were able to use one yesterday for somebody when some soap got in their eye. These things are in BT, STOT, the cottages. Every SCL home has an eyewash station now. The Elmer Building's Melbourne, we actually added a bottle to the wall above the sink. The recreation office, the kitchen, maintenance workshop has a bottle along with a, a chemical shower. The Young Building, we have one right in the hallway, and day training has one. If you use one of these, please do an incident report and let me know, and I'll try to replace it right away. And speaking of which, if you do have any accidents or incidents or result in injuries, please see a nurse right away. I mean, you have 24 hours, but don't wait around. Go have a nurse check you out to make sure you're good and you start the incident report. We will do an investigation. We want to make sure nobody else gets injured, whether there is bad practice, bad policies. We want to make changes to keep you safe. Any questions on all that? All right. Has anybody seen the new construction we're doing with our outpatient service? The place is huge. Well, we haven't figured out a name yet. We are coming up with one. I really think the Wesley Gaynor Outpatient Service Facility has a nice ring to it, guys. <laughs> Better shake your head no. We can shorten it. We will announce the name when we come up with it. But one thing is, when people are asking why are we building it, you know, we are good at what we do here. We want to help everybody. We want to make sure we empower people with dreams and disabilities. We also want to make sure we expand and enhance the quality of services. That's why we're building this. So let's make this our mission when we talk with people about why we need such a facility. The rest of your hand. Um, when you mentioned it, I was going to ask, are you planning on building any more parking spaces? I have no idea. Um, I really don't know. I will ask around and find out for you. Okay. okay. I, was just, I was just wondering, because there's a lot of people like parked over there and everything. Yes. And like when I come in the morning, I see a lot of unsettled people. So I don't want to park next to them or their home. So her question was, do we have plans to expand on our parking here? I really don't know. Um, but I will ask around. I will find out. And when I do, I will shoot out an email for, email for everybody what the plans will be. Now coming up, we do have our half marathon. Is anybody in here planning on running this? Beth, Beth, Beth. Yeah. Beth will be there. Good for you. We'll be rooting you on. <laughs> now before this half marathon we will be holding an expo where I have this gentleman who really loves to run there to tell us his story and give his little motivational talk he gets pumped up so please show your support by showing up on March 13th and they are starting the, uh, the uh, training runs for this again we'll be with you in spirit you got this <laughs> now for those of you that were part of our angel tree thank you very much because of you we raised almost $4,000 this year to make Christmas possible for people that were in need. These were service recipients and also uh, family members of staff that work here. So thank you for your generosity. And I can only imagine what we will do next year when we help people out. So thank you for being an angel for those that were in need.
And the last thing I have for you is to please put your end time at 955. Leave all the tests at the center of the table and try to have a great day. Thank you. I raced the Wendell Foster Half Marathon for my friend Leslie. And I raced the Half Marathon because Wendell Foster has always been there for me. I was in the Wendell Foster Half Marathon because Wendell Foster is my home. I volunteer at the Wendell Foster Half Marathon because it promotes a healthy community. We put on the Wendell Foster Half Marathon every year to promote a healthy community and to empower over 2,000 people with disabilities. On March 14th, come run with us. Mm -hmm.